All right. How are you feeling today? Hi, I'm Rish Desai. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Osmosis, and I'm also a pediatric infectious disease physician. And what I want to talk about is climate change. It's affecting all of us. And so specifically how to navigate the effects of climate change on your patients. Now, when I think about climate change, I realized uh, many years ago that the effects of climate change are not equal across geographies. Certain areas are affected, obviously, more than others. Uh, coastal areas, low-lying areas, island groups are affected much more than other areas, for example. But it also affects certain patient populations more than others. You wouldn't think about that necessarily as, as intuitive, but but usually it's the elderly, it's um, you know, the, the very young, it's people with uh, chronic illnesses, um, and it's people that, that may be working outdoors that, that often don't kind of fit into a vulnerable population in other contexts, but in this context, they're also considered vulnerable. So those are the groups that are often most affected by climate change. And so whenever we're talking about climate change, I want you to kind of specifically picture those patients in front of you and how it might affect them. So the, the three big categories to kind of walk away from uh, this, this, um, this piece are the acute disasters, right? Those are the, the floods, the fires, things like that. Then there's the, the gradual environmental changes. The, the slow changes that, that might be occurring, the slow warming of the temperatures and things like that. And then there's shifts in infectious disease patterns. You know, all of a sudden, uh, you've got new diseases in areas that never used to see those kinds of infections before. Those are the three big categories. I want to kind of walk through them one by one and give you specific to-dos that hopefully will help you as you kind of navigate uh, climate change. So let's start with the acute disasters. Acute disasters would be, again, things like floods, fires, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, all those kinds of things. And, and let's say, for example, one of these events strikes your, your area. Well, all of a sudden you've got an influx of patients that have many, many uh, times um, traumatic injuries. And those traumas are occurring in large numbers. And where do you think those are gonna go? Those are gonna go to the nearest hospitals. Well, it turns out that not every hospital is set up to be a trauma center. And so all of a sudden what you have is you have hospitals that if they're not a trauma center, they've gotta prepare for that and they've got to figure out you know, who's going to come and take care of these patients. If they are a trauma center, they're getting an influx that they're not used to. So all of a sudden, they've got to open up their parking lot to accept all these new trauma uh, patients that, that are coming up, uh, all at once. So in any situation, the hospital's got to kind of think through how they're going to prepare for this kind of a large acute disaster. Now, the other thing is you might have surrounding areas that get affected. So let's take fires, for example. Here in Northern California, not long ago, we had large, large fires, made national news, international news. Now, these fires may be occurring hundreds of miles away, but what happens is all the smoke that arises from those fires is spreading across. At that time, it was half of California was covered with kind of this thick, thick smoke. Well, as a result, you've got all sorts of individuals in the outlying areas that can't breathe, that have chronic pulmonary conditions that are kind of getting worse all sorts of issues that are not in that acute area. So that's another issue is kind of the geography ends up expanding well beyond that, that spot that you thought was affected. Another issue is the, the normal sort of care that people are used to, going to the pharmacy to get prescriptions, going to your, to your dialysis center, all that gets interrupted. So there, there are the acute injuries from the flood, the fire, the earthquake, but then all those services that people rely on, especially the vulnerable populations rely on, those folks can't get the, the services that they need. So those folks are the ones that, that have to figure out a way to get their medications. So in terms of to-dos, here's the, the actionable bit. If you're kind of thinking about acute disasters, go and talk to people that work at your hospital or skilled nursing facility or, or hospice center and say, hey, what's your emergency plan? Walk me through it. Tell me what, what we would do as a facility if this were to happen. And, and are we ready? So kind of getting an emergency plan together is very important. The second thing is think about your vulnerable population. Talk to that person and say, hey, do you have a, a backpack of medications that you can kind of grab and go? Do you have a list of medications that you can kind of get to someone if they need to go get medications for you? Do you have all that stuff ready? And, and making sure that they have that kind of to-go backpack, kind of uh, buy an exit and have a plan in place because, again, they're the ones that are going to be more vulnerable and have to figure out how to get all this stuff together in a situation that's that's quite uh, uh, disrupted. So now let's talk about gradual environmental changes. And these are things that are that are a little bit more insidious. They're not the the 
the really quick and dirty, you know, floods, fires, earthquakes, things like that. But it's kind of the aftermath. What happens after those things occur? So let's take uh, one gradual change. Let's take heat. So let's say it's been a long, hot summer. Temperatures are rising. Maybe it's breaking records. In fact, that is the case in many parts of the world today. In that context, if someone comes in with a complaint, let's say they come in with a headache, you might be tempted to think that it's a migraine or, or a stress headache, something like that, and you might give them a certain medication. You might say, well, why don't you go up on your dose of migraine medications or go and try this medication for your, for your uh, stress headache or cluster headache. But you might be missing the boat because if it's heat-related and they're having heat stroke, then they need a complete different set of interventions. Maybe they need to have air conditioning because they're they're, they're not very well off and can't afford it. Maybe you gotta work with a social worker to kind of accommodate that. Maybe they need to be advised to find a different way home so that they're not walking through the heat, maybe taking the bus instead. You know, a lot of these kind of things require a little bit of thought in terms of like what their day-to-day -day is like in the context of heat. And this might also uh, apply to someone that works outdoors. You might say, you know what, you, you are a, a construction worker, but in the, in the hot summer days, you gotta stay better hydrated so you're not getting these terrible headaches. You would only think about that if you're thinking about climate change as a possible cause. And a lot of people just don't think about that. So that's the kind of the first point is just to kind of think about the possibilities of what heat and more insidious causes have on the human body, like headaches and heat stroke. Let me give you another example. Let's say there was a flood. And of course, that it goes back to kind of the acute disaster. But now let's say two, three months have passed. And so, you know, you're not thinking about that flood anymore. Things have gotten better. People have gotten rid of the, uh, the water in their basements. But there might be some folks that you're seeing that haven't gotten rid of all of the water. Or maybe there's some water damage and it's led to some mold. Now they're coming to you and they're coughing more. Or maybe they're having some sort of pulmonary issue in general. And you're thinking, oh, maybe it's an exacerbation of their, their asthma. Or maybe it's their, their bronchitis. You, you may not be considering the fact that it's the mold that's causing the asthma, right? And so the, the incorrect solution would be to just go up on their steroid dose or maybe to give them more albuterol, something like that. The right approach would be to say, hey, let's target the problem. Let's, let's get rid of the mold. Tell me more about like, what's going on in your basement, why you're working down there in the first place. So it could be kind of having them not exposed to it as much. So the point is, if you think about the effects of environmental change that are more longstanding, things like mold, things like heat, then you'll actually get to the right solution. If, you, if you're not even thinking about them, you're, you may end up doing the wrong thing. You might end up giving them more medications that they don't need or going down the wrong path. So that's kind of the idea behind uh, environmental changes. That's mostly in terms of to do, really to consider what's happening in your environment, your area, and, and evaluate a person in that context. Okay, so the third way to think about this, or the third kind of category I think about, is shifts in infectious disease patterns. When you think about infections, you might think about a certain geography. So, for example, you might have ticks in the northeastern United States. You might have uh, certain fungal diseases that are kind of known to be in certain geographic areas as well. Well, what's happening now with climate change is that animals are moving to different areas, and with them, the ticks are moving as well. Uh, as areas get... Uh, desertification, where, where they're getting so hot that they're kind of turning to deserts. That means that certain fungal diseases are kind of moving as well. A couple of quick uh, specific examples. Let's start with ticks. Lyme disease is, is well known. And the areas that Lyme disease is occurring now are different than they were, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. And uh, Lyme is based for Lyme, Connecticut, northeastern United States. You're now seeing Lyme disease in other parts of the U.S. And the thought process is that, again, it's kind of moving where the animals are moving. Those ticks are now affecting more and more people. And if you're in these new areas and you're not used to seeing Lyme disease, well, this is a chance to kind of realize that climate change is affecting your, your patient population as well. Uh, another example is alpha-gal. Alpha-gal is a new disease uh, for certain physicians in, in the US. It, it wasn't known about, except for kind of very, very remote areas where the tick was found that was transmitting it. Now the tick is migrating, it's on the move. And so as a result, you're seeing alpha-gal disease in other areas as well. So the CDC does a good job of trying to keep up with this stuff. But unless you kind of keep up with your uh, public health department and the CDC, you may not know that these things are happening. Another example here, uh, let's take the fungus, coccidiomycosis, found in the southwestern corner of the U.S., uh, California, uh, Nevada, uh, Arizona. Now, because of the, the, the heat waves that are going through, you're seeing that fungus in other states. 
people are coming in with the same conditions, pulmonary nodules, they're, they're getting red bumps, desert spots on their legs. And if you're a physician that's not from those states, maybe you're unfamiliar with it, you may misdiagnose it, you may miss it. And so again, getting more and more familiar with kind of changing patterns in your area. So in terms of to-dos, here the key to-do is keeping up with your public health department, asking them, hey, what do you guys see? What should I be aware of? And the reverse, if you see something that's out of the ordinary for your clinical practice and you diagnose it, well, that's awesome, good job. But then make sure you make a phone call and let your public health department know and so that other people can kind of be aware of your experience. So those are the things that I would recommend you do so that we all stay informed with what's going on. The other key is making sure that you keep an open mind and, and not necessarily just kind of assume that what you knew of 10 years ago or 20 years ago in terms of a differential is still the correct differential today. You know, keep up with uh, conferences, your colleagues, et cetera, in terms of making sure that you're not missing things that maybe they're catching on to, but you haven't caught on to yet. So those are the kind of key to-dos around infections. Public health department, staying in touch with conferences, your colleagues, to make sure you're not missing the boat in terms of what's happening and what's changing in your area, because we're seeing these changes happening around the world. So just to recap, we've got a kind of uh, three big buckets. We've got acute disasters, understanding what your hospital's doing for the disasters, preparing your patients that are especially vulnerable to make sure they have that to-go backpack and that they're ready in case a disaster occurs with their medications and kind of basic needs uh, all set. Uh, thinking about gradual environmental changes, broadening your differential and thinking kind of about all the possibilities of how climate could be affecting new symptoms that your patients are having. And then finally, thinking about shifts in infectious disease patterns and keeping up with your public health department, kind of locally, also nationally, and then keeping up with conferences and your colleagues in terms of what they're seeing and sharing what you're finding as well so that other people can learn from your experience. So I hope that was helpful and uh, good luck and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch soon.